I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, okay. Let me briefly introduce you. So Umut Gursoy obtained his PhD in 2005 from MIT. His work was on different kind, different limits of holographic duality, which broadly speaking relates quantum field theories and gravitational theories. Afterwards, he worked as a postdoc in Ecole Normale Supérieure, Utrecht University and CERN. In his postdoc work, he applied these uh, holographic techniques uh, or techniques coming from holography to highly interactive systems that appear in condensed matter and nuclear physics systems, such as quark gluon plasma. Uh, since 2012, he's a professor at Utrecht University. Umut Ojong, welcome again. And you may start whenever you like. I will be warning, in, warning you in the last five minutes. In the last five minutes, okay. So right. <clears throat> how, how much uh, should I spend on the talk? Um, 40, if, 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 the, if you cannot fit it in 40, maybe you can extend it at max to 45 minutes. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be uh, to keep this in time. So, well, thank you very much for the invitation and thinking of me to, to uh, invite to this uh, uh, beautiful workshop. And, um, well, I also hope that everybody is doing fine in this pandemic, of course, uh, especially, I mean, you should be doing fine, clearly, that you are here. Uh, but your your uh, your loud ones as well. So um, okay, so uh, this is not going to be as mathematical as um, the previous two talks. Um, but of course, in 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 theoretical physics, if you um, dig deep enough, you will always find some uh, nice, interesting mathematical structures. And there is going to be also in this talk. But uh, my my motivation mainly is going to be um, uh, phenomenology. Of, uh, of this physics that I will describe here. And so the, the title of my talk is the hydrodynamics and the holography of the spin current. And this is a topic that became uh, quite interesting. It's a high trend now in the last uh, couple of years or so, uh, especially because of um, some experiments which show that uh, spin current can be generated in, uh, in, in, a, in a variety of systems. Uh, but to understand it uh, in quantum field theory requires a lot of mathematical development. So I, I will, I will um, talk about those. There's not going to be any um, deep mathematics here, but uh, but okay. So this is um, this is the subject I will be talking about. And um, the, the this talk is going to be based on this paper, uh, which is now published at, uh, in JHEP, uh, this uh, with uh, Domingo Gallegos, who is my PhD student, who's graduating uh, this year. Okay, so. <clears throat> um, well, when, when we so the subject, as I said, is spin transport, which means that um, um, the the transport or, or of uh, a collective excitation of spin in a in a strongly correlated system, like um, like uh, for example Dirac Weyl semimetals or graphene, or in quark gluon plasma, but um, but it has other applications also. For example, in astrophysics, where you talk about where one of the the, inter the subjects of interest is uh, the neutron stars. And the neutron stars are made of neutrons, and of course, uh, at the core of the neutrons, there is uh, some strongly correlated um, core where which contains uh, spins of the neutrons, and the spin transport can be interest interesting there. And especially when you think of uh, gravitational wave experiments that uh, come from merger of bin binary neutron stars, the um, all kind of transport phenomena, magnetic transport and spin transport as well, becomes interesting. So, I mean, when you talk about transport of spin degrees of freedom. People usually think of um, condensed matter systems, but um, of course, that's quite important and interesting to understand. But also in nowadays, also in high energy physics, the transport of spin uh, is getting interesting, is, is becoming a, a subject of interest. <clears throat> okay, by the way, just um, please ask me any question. You don't have to wait until the end of the talk. Uh, at any time, I'm, uh, you're, you're very welcome. Okay, so um, the, this, the interesting thing that became I mean, the, 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 the experiments that I, I mentioned already, which um, kind of put um, spin transport in the agenda, was uh, two different kinds of experiments. One of them is uh, in condensed matter. So this essentially uh, um, more or less started the, um, the subject of, um, you know, spin, well, liquid spintronics. And um, another one in, 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 in heavy ion collisions, which I will mention later. So. This one, this experiment, I will just first uh, let me uh, describe the setup of this experiment and I will try to explain 
the, the transport properties in the system. And so think of, for example, um, well, we, we are very, you are very familiar with the fact that uh, when you have a, a fluid flowing in a, in a tube in the presence of a magnetic field, it generates electric voltage, essentially because of the Lorentz force. So um, these gentlemen, Takashi et al, um, did the same experiment in a different setting. Instead of the magnetic field, they generated some, uh, some kind of vorticity. So these vortices in the fluid. This is uh, what we are talking about here is, uh, is something like, a, it's a strongly correlated um, uh, metal, which became fluid, like, like these, uh, these ones. Okay, so and in the presence of vorticity, of course, vorticity also rotates because of the spin orbit coupling in the system, in, in quantum field theory. Uh, the, it also rotates the spins of the particles in the direction of the vort vortices. So here, this is uh, in more detail, the experimental setup, what they did is that they, um, because essentially because of the friction at the boundary of the tube, uh, the velocity here is smaller than in the middle. And this essentially brings uh, some, some vorticity because this velocity gradient, this velocity is larger than this. So there's some velocity gradient, which uh, produces some vorticity in the fluid and the vorticity as a result of the spin orbit coupling, the spins are oriented uh, in the direction of the vortex. And then um, there's some kind of uh, spin current generated in this direction. Okay, so the spin current is proportional to the gradient of the vorticity and the spin density is proportional to the to the vortex density itself so <clears throat> so this was i mean of course the idea was uh, was around for for a long time but this this made it very clear uh, that uh, this can be generated in in um, in a nice clear experimental setting so what i want to say uh, I mean, one of the points that I'm trying to make here in this in this talk uh, is that you know this extremely similar setting is also realized in a, in a completely different context in a quark gluon plasma, uh, where you consider a heavy ion collision. So you you just collide two heavy ions in an off-central collision. You generate some non-trivial angular momentum because of the uh, because of the, the impact parameter, you have an impact parameter in the system. So this becomes a strongly correlated system, which is the quark gluon plasma after the, the heavy ions collide, and then it starts rotating. So as it rotates, the same thing is supposed to be here in QCD also there's spin orbit coupling. So you would expect the, uh, the quarks to be aligned with the, with, the, with the angular momentum of the rotating plasma. And so this has been, again, the idea was, uh, was around for, for some time, since uh, 2017 or so, even earlier. But this was realized um, last year in, uh, in, the, um, at, uh, in Brookhaven by the STAR collaboration. And they, what they have seen, what they observed is that these, a certain kind of particles, which are uh, some baryons called hyperons, um, uh, they, they became polarized. Okay, so their polarization is really proportional to uh, the, uh, the impact parameter of the system, which clearly shows that they are polarized because of the vorticity, because of the angular momentum that uh, there is in the system. And um, so this has been used. So here in the set, so this is the, the result of the experiment. You can see that this is the polarization, some definition of polarization that you can see here in this, um, in this cross section. <clears throat> this end denotes the, the, the hyperons. So these reds are hyperons, the, 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 the blue are anti-hyperons. The difference between, the, between them is essentially due to magnetic field because these are charged particles. Charged magnetic field also aligns the spins, so that's why, um, if, but, but of course the, that alignment is in proportion to the charge of the particle. So if it is hyperon, it's um, the red one. If it's anti-hyperon, it's the blue one. So there's a difference, but, but if you just take, for example, the, 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 um, the mean value of these two, you see that there is a non-trivial polarization uh, essentially due to, due to vorticity. And this has been used to, and, and the, the setting is very clear here. You see that you know, there are these um, velocity gradients. So these are just uh, projectile spectators. So these are the, the atoms that are, sorry, the nucleons that, uh, that, that are not uh, wounded. So they, they became essentially, they are they free, they just fly off. And the rest is uh, interacting, strongly interacting. So this is the quark gluon plasma. And essentially because of the experimental setting and the impact parameter, you see that this velocity, there's a velocity gradient and you would expect some kind of um, spin flow. And this is this is, has been realized, and this result, this experimental result, is uh, used to, um, um, to 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 get an, to estimate essentially the the vorticity in the quark gluon plasma. And they found something like ten to twenty two um, 
per second, which is the, of course the craziest number that you can think of in terms of what is in, in, in any um, physical system in the universe. So this, if this is true, this is, this is an extreme, um, extreme vorticity. Okay. Um, all right. So as I said, what, what interests me mostly is um, not, well, to, to understand these experimental settings, which is quite, quite generic as, as you have seen. But to understand all of that in a, in a situation where um, the underlying theory is quantum field theory, uh, and especially when the quantum field theory is strongly coupled, this becomes a, a big challenge for theory. And um, there are a couple of tools that we can use. And one of them is hydrodynamics. And the other is, uh, yeah, as I will just advocate, holography. So uh, let me start with, uh, with the uh, remind you, reminding what hydrodynamics is. So hydrodynamics is, uh, most of the people are familiar with in the, in the form of like in the landau lifshitz kind of uh, sense is, is a theory of fluids, but uh, this has been generalized and a much, much, more, much, general, much more general understanding of hydrodynamics has uh, arise, arose in the last um, 10 or 20 years or so. And uh, that established hydrodynamics as, a, as an effective field theory, essentially. So it's an effective field theory of quantum field theory. Uh, the part of the theory that is uh, the part of slow variables in, in, in a quantum field theory. So in every quantum field theory, you can um, divide the, the variables, the di degrees of freedom in your system into in terms of uh, fast variables and slow variables. And the fast variables, you can think of them as a UV. So in, a, in an RG group sense, RG group flow sense, you can think of them as the UV variable uh, in the Wilsonian sense. And the slow variables are the IR variables, if you like. So if you think of, for example, some fluctuation in the system, um, you, you expect this fluctuation to, to relax to some equilibrium value. And the fast variables relax quite fast. So they, 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 they relax in some time, some typical time scale that depends on the, the details of the system, uh, the, which I'm calling tau relax. Okay, so if you make a fluctuation like this, it will directly relax down to this equilibrium value because this quantity is not conserved. But, uh, but if there are conserved quantities, which I'm also, which, um, become the IR quantities, the slow variables, they cannot just, uh, so the, their value at a given point in space time cannot just change uh, and, and go to the equilibrium value. So they have to be transported from one point to the other one to, to, to relax. So this creates uh, collective waves in the system. And that is, that's why it's, uh, it becomes a theory of hydrodynamics. And um, so this, this slow relaxation, uh, this, the, 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 the slow variables, the conserved quantities relax much slower than the fast quantities and their relaxation time is much, much, much larger than the, uh, than the style relax. Okay. So, um, well, as I said, hydrodynamics is an effective theory of these conserved quantities. And this, this uh, theory is organized in a, in a derivative expansion as clear from this discussion, it, this derivative expansion should be organized in such a way that you know it's given by this um, tau relax times the, <clears throat> the derivative of um, the slow variable because this, this quantity is much smaller. So you can make an expansion like that, I mean, it's more than one. And uh, or in terms of the, the mean three path in the system, uh, which would uh, at, at times the, the gradient of the slow variable. So it, both of them are uh, part of the expansion parameters of your theory. So in some sense, you can write down some effective field theory, and then you can expand your effective field theory in these quantities and, um, and, and do um, study how the, the conserved quantities are transported in the system. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the, um, the, the goal of this, this talk is then um, to understand hydrodynamics with, uh, with spin current. Okay, I spent already like 10 minutes explaining the setting, but I think the setting is quite important. Uh, there will be some details in the in, in the following, which which may you may not be able to follow, or you may be able to follow. I don't know, but uh, the important thing is to understand this uh, this setup. I think. So um, so what we want to do, and it's it's uh, I mean, lo and behold, it this theory of hydrodynamics for the spin current in a relativistic system has not been set set up yet, has not been um, established. So that's 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 quite interesting. Even though we are living in 2020, that because that's that has not been uh, so that was never important before, but it becomes important, especially the relativistic systems becomes important. Let me tell you why. Um, in these experimental settings, because here, for example, I mean, even though you you would think of this as uh, not experimental, 
I mean, sorry, not uh, relativistic. If you think of a system, similar system like graphene or Dirac and wild semi-metals, there the, the dispersion relation becomes linear, which essentially becomes uh, relativistic. So it's important to understand. Um, so to establish relativistic, okay, the speed of uh, light is not one, but for, for a smaller speed of light, but the dispersion is still linear. So that, be, that becomes important to understand. That makes it important to understand spin transport in a relativistic systems. And also, as I said, in quark Coulomb plasma, directly relativistic, right? So because that has not been, um, so that's the reason that has not been studied in detail, but I think we, we have to develop a mathematical machinery to understand hydrodynamics with spin currents. So, so now in this particular case of um, spin current, the hydrodynamics contains two conserved quantities. One of them is the, <clears throat> the energy momentum tensor and the other one is the spin current itself. So the spin current here I denoted by, by um, S lambda mu nu. And um, so lambda is the, um, the flow direction. So it the, the just denotes the direction of the flow. This is a four, four index, of course, zero, one, two, three. And mu nu is the, the plane of, uh, of rotation. So you can think of this, this contains also boosts. Okay, so this is rotation. When mu nu is, uh, is in the spatial directions, ij, um, this and then lambda is zero, for example, this becomes the spin density um, proportional to on the perpendicular to the plane spanned by ij indices. Okay, so um, the outline of the talk is first of all, I will um, <clears throat> describe, I, I will just uh, talk about some ambiguities in defining spin current in, in, in quantum field theory, and then I will um, come to the, the hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic description of spin current. And it will become very important for us to, to turn on what is called torsion in the system, which, um, which will directly source the spin current in the sense that in effective field theory, if you want to study, for example, the, um, the correlation functions of energy momentum tensor, you have to be looking at fluctuations of, of a metric. That doesn't mean that in quark Coulomb plasma, we have an untrivial metric, it's metric is flat, but you still make a small fluctuation and that allows you as a source that couples to the energy momentum tensor, it allows you to calculate um, the correlation functions of T mu nu, uh, the stress tensor um, in effective field theory. So similarly, spin current is, uh, is coupled to torsion. So torsion is, uh, is the source for spin current. So it will be important to understand um, how to write down hydrodynamics with, uh, with torsion. And then, <clears throat> In hydrodynamics, it's essentially just like uh, it gives you a package of um, how to organize your degrees of freedom and how the their uh, equations of motion are written and how to expand this gradient expansion. But this gradient expansion is going to be given by some coefficients times uh, times terms times operators, and these coefficients are called um, transport coefficients. And for example, conductivity is one of the transport coefficients, like diffusion diffusion constants and things like that. And um, so another important constant is uh, transport coefficient is, trans is the, the shear viscosity or bulk viscosity. And in the presence of spin current and torsion, there will be many, many, many more. And all of these transport coefficients in a, in a theory where uh, there is strong coupling uh, cannot be really computed directly from quantum field theory. So we need uh, another uh, alternative description of, uh, of the system, which, um, which, which can be mapped to, to hydrodynamics. And this, this description turns out to be the holography. Okay, so um, the important point here is the different uh, than the previous settings is that in, in this case, we need the holographic description uh, using a, based on a first order gravity. Okay, that's because we need the, 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 the metric and the torsion to be two independent variables. So we need first order formulation of gravity. And what I will describe in the, by the end of this talk is that uh, there, there exists such an interesting theory in five dimensions. It's called low log churn simons theory of gravity. It's a dynamical theory uh, as opposed to the three-dimensional churn simons theory. Uh, it, it becomes dynamical in five dimensions. And uh, what, we, what I will describe, I'm not going to derive them here in this talk, but I will show you some analytic black hole solutions to this theory in five dimensions which can be used to understand uh, spin current in, the, in a strongly coupled uh, system. Okay. And this will also allow us to, to calculate uh, transport coefficients and there will be new transport coefficients and new transport phenomena associated to spin. Okay, then I will, dis then I will discuss. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, as I mentioned, there's some ambiguity in definition of spin current in quantum field theory. That, that, is, that is something that is familiar to everybody. 
And that is uh, essentially what you do is uh, you, you define the total angular momentum in your system, in a relativistic system, let's say, in this way. So this is the, this is the energy momentum uh, times uh, the position, uh, space time position, plus some spin current. So this, this term would be absent if you're, if you're dealing with the quantum field theory of scalar quantities, but if you think of uh, quantum field theory of uh, that transforms non-trivially under, under the Lorentz transformations, there is, a, there is some, some spin current here. But this is ambiguous. The reason is that um, the conservation laws are really the, the conservation of energy momentum and the conservation of the angular, the, uh, the total angular momentum. So this is the orbital part of the angular momentum and this is the spin part. But it's, there is no, I mean, you can of course derive a conservation equation for the, for the spin part, but that's not going to be uh, invariant under, um, uh, under certain uh, pseudo gauge transformations. These are called, so you can always redefine your energy momentum tensor by uh, adding a derivative of some, um, some, some tree form, okay? That is anti-symmetric in these last two indices. And, um, but that, that is typically used, for example, to remove the anti-symmetric part of the energy momentum tensor. So after this redefinition, if you just, um, so at the same time, you just uh, change S lambda mu nu with the same quantity, the same tree form, and the equations of motion is, uh, are left invariant. So in particular, you can choose a gauge where phi equals exactly the spin part, and that can be used to set the spin spin current to zero. So you can always say you can always go to a frame where the spin current is set to zero. So there is some kind of an ambiguity, um, but at the same time we have to do something about this ambiguity because you see there is an exp there is an experiment which just shows that there is a spin current. So what is the spin current in which frame? How do we define it? And uh, so what I will argue in this um, in this talk is that if you want to do um, hydrodynamics in the presence of such an ambiguity, you really need to turn on the, the direct source for the spin current, which completely remove this ambiguity. And that direct source becomes torsion. So let me um, describe um, the, the spin transport or spin in general in effective field theory ap um, approach. So suppose that you have a quantum field theory, which uh, so this is a collective theory description of all the fields in your system, then you integrate them out in the presence of some, um, some, some field bind. So that is, uh, that is the metric and, and some spin connection. Okay, so I'm thinking of field bind and spin connection as two independent uh, objects at the moment. So if you just um, take do this um, integral, then what you are gonna get is uh, some effective action, which is given in terms of these sources, the field bind and the, and the, and the spin connection. And then you can define your energy momentum and the spin current by just taking variations with respect to the field bind for the metric and the, and the spin connection. So that will be the definition of your, um, your spin current. So essentially here you can see that the spin current is co directly coupled to the, to the um, spin connection, which in the flat case becomes uh, totally the same thing as the torsion. So that's um, interesting. Okay, so <clears throat> as you can see, these, uh, these two notions, the spin current and the energy momentum tensor becomes uh, dependent to each other because essentially in the, in the absence of torsion, so torsion is defined as, the, as this quantity, which is the, um, the covariant um, derivative of the field bind where the, the gauge field in the covariant derivative is, is, is the spin connection itself. So this quantity, when the torsion vanishes, it uh, relates the variations of um, the, the energy momentum, sorry, the, um, the the field bind and the variations of the spin connection to each other. So it becomes essentially, it gives exactly the same, the same kind of equation. So like this part will come from the variation of the, the, the field bind, this, this part would come from the variation of the, of the spin current where the spin current is set to zero of the, um, of the spin connection. So when this is zero, you, you really get uh, some ambiguity in that sense. But when, when there's a non-trivial torsion and you keep your non-trivial torsion as a source in your, in your theory, this ambiguity goes away and you can formulate an unambiguous um, uh, theory of hydrodynamics based on this effective action in the presence of uh, two independent sources now, spin connection and, uh, and the field bind. And in terms of um, dealing with torsion, it, it becomes somewhat easier to formulate the entire quantum field theory in terms of contortion. Contortion is something um, <clears throat> related, it's, it's in one-to-one -one correspondence with the torsion. But in fact, so torsion, you can think of it as the so there's some affine connection in your system and the affine connection can be um, divided into two parts, the symmetric part and the anti-symmetric part. The symmetric part is essentially the Levi-Civita connection 
and the anti-symmetric part distortion. This is the same thing, but uh, instead of the, the affine connection, you are decomposing here the, the spin connection. So the spin connection can be de de decomposed into the, uh, the Levi-Civita part, Levi-Civita spin connection, which is related to the, indeed, to the, to the field mind, to the metric, and, and plus uh, contortion part. And the contortion part is directly related to distortion. So when torsion is non-trivial, you have a contortion part. So the spin connection becomes uh, uh, a composition of these these two components. So at lowest order, if you think of the lowest order uh, in the source of the spin flow, for example, in the flat space, what you would get is that you can set e to one, and this this is gone completely. Okay, so the, the usual spin connection, which is given in terms of derivatives of the field bind is gone, but you are left with a contortion. So you really need to, so, and then you can see that the spin connection becomes exactly given by the torsion or contortion in this case. So spin current will be in the, in, in flat space, spin current will be completely sourced by this contortion. Okay. So, I mean, people are at this point, um, but I've given this talk a couple of times and people are usually asking the question um, whether Okay, that's nice. Okay, so you have a contortion in your system. You can formulate your quantum field here the way you like, but uh, why is this relevant for quark long plasma where there is no torsion in the system? That is true, but I, I think I, uh, <clears throat> as I was motivating, the this is just a placeholder if you want, right? So this is what you do it here. This is like a bookkeeping device, the contortion. So you you expand your um, your effective action in terms of contortion, and then you take variations with respect to contortion to to calculate the um, the the endpoint functions of the spin current. And then at the end of the game, of course, you set k to zero. Okay, so this is the this is what we will do. It doesn't matter whether whether the contortion is zero or not in your system, you still have to turn it on as a source, just like um, just like the metric in quantum field theory. Okay. Um, yeah, we always have this trouble. I don't know why. Yeah. I do this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what are the hydrodynamic equations then? So the hydrodynamic equations in this effective action formalism is uh, obtained by, by, again, taking variations, by, um, by using, by essentially studying the, the symmetries of the system. The symmetries in this case, associated to, to the field bind and the spin connection are two. So they're, in, they're infinitely, I mean, these are uh, continuous symmetries. One of them is the feomorphism symmetry and the other one is the local Lorentz transformations. So this action is supposed to be invariant it, uh, we have to require for physical consistency, we have to require that this action is invariant under diffeomorphisms, where this is a lead derivative along some, uh, some, some, some vector, some space time vector psi, where both of them transform, of course, as, uh, it, as given by the lead derivative. And there are local Lorentz transformations, which are given, which are parameterized by this um, Lorentz transformation parameter lambda AB, where it's anti symmetric in AB. And um, the, the spin connection transforms under the Lorentz transformations like the covariant derivative of lambda. And if you just, then, so the, the idea is now simple, this, everything is clear. So you just start with this uh, general effective action and you, de you, you derive the equations of motion by demanding that it's invariant under these two, two transformations. If you, and one of them gives you the conservation of the energy momentum tensor, which essentially comes from the pyromorphism symmetry. And this is the thing that is familiar to, to most of the people, of course. And um, the other transformation, the local Lorentz transformations, if you demand it that uh, the system is invariant under, under local Lorentz transformations, then essentially you get, uh, you get the second equation, which is the, the, the so-called conservation or non-conservation, if you want, law of, um, of, the, of the spin current. But these are the hydrodynamic equations. These are the analogs of uh, Navier-Stokes equations in a relativistic setting including um, the spin current. Okay. So here, for example, what you see is that the energy momentum tensor is typically conserved. It's not, it becomes non-conserved only in the presence of a spin current coupled to some curvature in your system, but the curvature in the end of the game, we will, uh, in the, at the end of the calculation, we will set uh, it to flat space. In flat space, the curvature will, will vanish. Um, <clears throat> and and when, when the torsion is also set to zero, the curvature will vanish another term that, that directly couples the anti-symmetric part of the energy momentum tensor to the, to the function. So these are, if you like, the, the, um, the work that is being done on the, on the energy momentum tensor. So this can complete the analogous to the work term that you would have in, um, in hydrodynamics in the presence of a charge current, just U1 charge current, which would be like the, um, 
you know, the current times electric field. So this is the analog of the electric field. This is just D of the spin connection and the spin connection. So this is the, the term that couple, the operator that couples to the spin connection, uh, which is the analog of the, um, the source, sorry, the, um, the current that couples to the, to the gauge field. So this is completely analogous to A times F um, term. I'm sorry, the um, J times F term. And, and the, the spin current also has a similar equation. On the right-hand side, it, it becomes uh, non-conserved in the presence of an anti-symmetric part of energy momentum tensor and, uh, and in the presence of contortion. But as we can see now, here's that the anti-symmetric part of the energy momentum tensor, even in the absence of um, you know, contortion, just generates already spin current. Okay, okay fine. So this is the, the equations that we would like to understand. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, I have one. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, so I, I just wonder, is, is that contortion sourced by uh, matter field uh, in, in your theory? Yeah, that would be the case, for example, in, um, in supergravity. You can always, uh, no, in this case, no. That's a good question. But um, that, that, that requires having, having some gravity. So in the end, no, the contortion, this is, as I said, the contortion is, is only um, a bookkeeping device. Yeah, but I, I can explicitly calculate from your Lagrangian, right? So I, I should be able no, to no, write down. No, 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 no. That that's the source that you put by hand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just like just like uh, just like the metric fluctuation. You don't calculate the metric fluctuation in terms of your metric fields. Yeah. Yeah. That okay. is only the case in a dynamical gravity. So here there's no dynamical gravity. Okay, good. Thanks. Umuto jump, but can I ask one more thing as well? Yeah, but if you were to have some fermionic matter coupled to the system, then it yeah. would be it would be coming into the torsion expression, right? Well, no, but as I said, uh, not not in not not in um, no, because the the torsion so that that becomes the case in um, in in in, uh, in gravity, right? So that uh, you know the torsion can always be expressed by by integrating out the, the, the fermionic metal field. So for example, if you have some kind of coupling between the fermions, that will generate some torsion, but that, that requires having dynamical gravity. So that okay. comes from solving the equations of dynamical gravity. Here, I'm not, um, so I'm, I'm just looking at linear small fluctuations around metric and, um, and zero torsion. Okay, so that, that and, and those two are essentially just, you, can, you should think of them as sources. So just like in the case of- uh, uh, Can I just uh, comment? Uh, yeah. I'm just a question. Uh, yeah. Because if you have a, a continua with uh, defects, uh, like disclinations or dislocations- Exactly, I will come to- perfect. As, uh, as Yes, 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 perfect. Uh, yeah, this is, this is it. <laughs> John, by the way, I should remind you of time as well. It's 32. Uh, yeah, yeah I know. I'm going slow, of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm aware of my, my slowness always. Um, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll go a bit faster, but okay, so Tekino Oja was uh, kind of um, right on the, on the right point. So he was, uh, he was mentioning that you can actually uh, source torsion in, in the presence of uh, dislocations and things like that. And that in, exactly, it becomes very important in the case of um, um, atomic systems like graphene, at the same time, it should be strongly interacting, for example, in, in our case. So for example, you can, you can think of, this is the atomic structure of, uh, this, of graphene. And if you think of like uh, inserting one one atom here, which makes this uh, this changes the atomic structure, it, especially that it is localized point, that indeed brings down some kind of um, torsion because now these two um, so this doesn't close. So if you just um, parallel transport one vector uh, along the the direction of the other vector and take do the inverse operation and take the difference, this is the definition of torsion. This doesn't close here exactly because of this dislocation, and this torsion becomes proportional to that uh, that dislocation given by this burger burger's vector. Okay. And um, um, so torsion uh, becomes essentially the continuum this description of dislocations uh, in your in the background, and then you do you do RG flow, and then um, you know you just go to the IR, so in the Wilsonian sense, and you you derive this effective field theory for graphene, and that becomes um, uh, so torsion becomes essentially your, your source or it becomes a dynamical degree of freedom in this case because that's, uh, the, these dislocations can also move around. Okay, so torsion becomes an interesting, it becomes real in a condensed matter system. In, a, in, a, in quark lone plasma, it's not real, but it's still an important um, conceptual tool to, to derive these endpoint functions of the spin current. Okay, 
So um, in the view of time, I think I have to be, um, I have to speed up. Um, so these uh, in four dimensions, well, I mean, we can understand them, we can classify these, uh, these kind of torsion sources. So it now the, the rule, the game becomes uh, very clear. We have to understand how to decompose torsion in three plus one dimensions in, uh, <clears throat> by using essentially the symmetry, the Lorentz symmetry of the system, right? So we have to decompose into, into tensors, like vectors, scalars, et cetera, and then understand all of the, uh, each component, what does it correspond to, what, the, what kind of spin current it generates. Uh, well, this, this um, um, classification can be understood in three dimensions, much easier than four dimensions. In three dimensions, it turns out that uh, you know, whether, depending on um, the, this, this, this spin connection or, or torsion, which becomes the same thing in, in flat space because of this relationship, which comes just by using the definition of the, the torsion, there are two different kinds of classes. There are edge dislocations, which means that this um, this index here i is proportional. It's in the so the Burgers vector. So this is the the direction of the Burgers vector. So the Burgers vector is proportional. It is in the um, in the plane. So this is in that case you have some kind of an edge dislocation like that. So this is the loop that is shown here. Here the loop is here. So this doesn't close as you can see. Or you can have this Burgers vector again. This one is uh, perpendicular to the loop plane. So the loop plane is here. So you can see that this location is perpendicular. The Burgess vector is given by this one here. So here the Burgess vector is given by something like this. Okay. So this becomes clear. So there are like three different uh, screw dislocations, obviously that you can write down because of uh, AB is running from, uh, so there are three different kind of anti-symmetric combinations. And for the edge dislocations, there are, there are obviously six degrees of freedom. So in total, there are like nine. So this is three, this is three. So this is nine, three times three. So in four dimensions, it becomes more complicated because you have time direction as well involved. And, uh, but, but still, you can use the, the same kind of um, description. You can decompose that in terms, you can write, first of all, this, um, this spin connection. You can, from the spin connection, you can construct a gauge invariant quantity, that is the, the Wilson loop. And the Wilson loop, depending on the, the index mu here, it can be a Polyakov loop if it is zero, or if it is spatial index, it becomes a Wilson loop. And then these, um, the classification is again becomes very clear. So you have Wilson edge dislocations, Wilson screw dislocations, Polyakov edge and Polyakov screw dislocations. Total there are 24 because this is six, this is four. Okay, but uh, but this kind of the, this, the composition, obviously, if, if you do divide your um, your loop into Wilson and Polyakov, that's not a Lorentz invariant decomposition. And what we need really is to, to come up with a Lorentz invariant um, the, the composition to be able to do quantum field theory um, well, or hydrodynamics. So the, the Lorentz invariant decomposition is, is given by this. So you can decompose any um, anti-symmetric two tensor, like uh, in terms of a vector, an axial vector, uh, and, um, and a tensor. So the vector in this case is given by that. So this is just uh, B tilde. And the axial part is given by that, A tilde. So there are two vectors, as you can see. And then um, in the presence, of, in, the, in the case of hydrodynamics, we have an additional vector, U mu, which denotes essentially the, the direction of the flow of the current. Okay, so the zero component u zero, and so u as this is the four velocity okay, of the current, and the four velocity using this four velocity you can further decompose these these different components the tensor and these two vectors into into further components and that becomes essentially this. So here I'm not going to get into details of that. Um, I guess the slides will be available later if you would like to, to want to study it, but it's also in our paper that uh, so you have essentially uh, one scalar. So you can see that the scalars. This is an axial scalar. This is a this is a scalar, and um, and then there are there are two um, two transverse vectors like uh, like this v1 and v2 and v1. There's these two, and then there are two anti-symmetric sorry the axial vectors, and then there is a, there are two um, traceless transverse symmetric tensors. So this h and this c. Okay, so this is the, the full decomposition. Um, where this delta is um, the, the projector transfers to the direction of the flow. So when you dot this to u, it just gives you zero. It's a unique definition of that. And then, um, then you can construct a constitutive relations, just like in, in uh, relativistic hydrodynamics, a la lambda or Lipschitz, um, but now in the presence of spin current. So it becomes a little bit more interesting, of course, in this case, the, 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 the composition of the energy momentum transfer becomes the same. So you have an energy part, you have a pressure part, but this is the projection, the projector. Uh, transfers to the to the flow, and then the typically you don't you have these heat currents to be completely symmetric. So there is no Q and Q bar different. But in this case, we have to include, as I mentioned a couple of times, the, the anti-symmetric part of the energy momentum transfer. So there, these these two become two independent degrees of freedom, 
And on top, on top of that, there's always a symmetric transverse um, shear part, okay, that describes the shear, for example, that involves the shear, um, um, the, the shear viscosity. But then in this case, there's also an anti-symmetric part, the, uh, again, transverse anti-symmetric part, which is typically called, which is called um, intrinsic torque. Okay, so it's like an intrinsic torque in your system. And the spin current can be decomposed in a similar way. Let me just um, skip all of this. So this is now the composition in terms of these, uh, these components that, that couple each of those components in that spin current couple separately to this, this, all of these, uh, these different structures. Okay. So this is all that complicated mess, which can be written in a, in a simple, uh, you, by noticing that there's a component proportional to U mu, the, um, the flow times the spin density. So when you take, for example, this to be zero and this to be ij, that would tell you um, the spin uh, oriented, the density of spins oriented in the k direction, okay? And then this will be the transverse part of the spin current. All the rest contributes to the transverse part, which will, which will um, explain some kind of dissipation in the, in the, in the spin current. Okay. So this is a summary of um, what we have found in this paper that uh, this is uh, just the decomposition of, of all of that. Um, so the degrees of freedom are one, one. So there are like two, four different vectors, two vectors and two anti, two uh, axial vectors and two um, tensors. So this is the total degree of freedom. If you add, add them up, you get four. Okay, so <clears throat> these are the constitutive relations and we have the equations of motion. So we can just go ahead and just do some kind of a calculation for hydrodynamics. Um, I have only, I think, um, can I take maybe um, four more minutes? Yes, sure, Roger. Okay, well, thank you very much. So let me skip um, some part, you know, conclude anyway. So the, well, let me just uh, first show some physics. The, um, so you can, it, the, the, it goes like this. So you, you can define, so let me give you some detail of how to do really uh, quantum field, how, how to do effective field theory with this, okay, for, for the hydrodynamics. So you define, first of all, the spin chemical potential that is given by contraction of this um, spin connection with the U mu. And that can be decomposed into a vector and A1. So a, two vectors and one axial vector, exactly the way that I, I described before. And then from these spin chemical potentials, these mu AB, you need to construct an, a, a, a Lorentz invariant quantity, uh, sorry, a scalar quantity. And that scalar quantity, of course, cannot involve these indices. So you have to contract, uh, you have to construct by using these uh, different components, you have to construct scalars. So there are three only, only three ways of con constructing those scalars. There are three different scalars, which I call mu i. So now your, um, your Lagrangian, your effective Lagrangian becomes a, a function of temperature and these, um, these three scalar chemical, spin chemical potentials. And then you, you, you write down the most general expansion of a general quantum field theory uh, that involves these, uh, these, uh, these degrees of freedom. So it can also involve at a, at a higher order term, in the first order derivative level. So this is the zeroth order in derivatives. At the first order in derivatives, it can involve, for example, vorticity, acceleration, and these different components uh, contracted with these, uh, these different vectors. So these are the most general things that you can write down. And then um, the polarization here is going to be given completely by the spin chemical potentials and vorticity and acceleration. So the, you have a vorticity in your system, acceleration and spin chemical potential that they are all sourcing this, uh, this spin current, which you can read off from this expression. For example, here, these are the, um, the spin chemical potentials, as you can see, this one, this one, and that one, that sources some part. And then vorticity, acceleration, this is a, a dual vorticity. This is also proportional to epsilon, contracted with vorticity, and this is epsilon construct, contracted with, uh, with acceleration. So there are four different transport coefficients that you have to compute. Um, and then you can go ahead and for, 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 for example, for, uh, for the applications in quarkulon plasma, you can consider some simple um, flow, hydrodynamic flow, where the u tau, the, um, the proper time direction of, uh, of the um, four velocity is given by one. It's a simple boost invariant flow called the Bjorken flow. And then you can compute some spin currents, which becomes like that. Uh, so which decays in time and uh, you know, it polarizes the fluid. So again, essentially you can compare these results. If, if we know this transport coefficient, we would be, we would be able to compare this result with the, with the experiment. So now the question becomes how to compute these transport coefficients. Okay, so these, uh, these transport coefficients here. Well, for that we need holography. Um, <clears throat> I only have like five minutes or so, so I will just, um, do this very quickly. I will assume that everybody knows about holography. Uh, let me just remind you that the holography is um, 
mapping a, a current on the boundary theory. So this is the boundary, this is the bulk. And in the bulk, I'm assuming there is some kind of a black hole, there's a horizon. And the, so holography, what it does is that it just maps the, the, the boundary, the collective excitations on the boundary, which are denoted generally by, by this current J. In our case, this will be the spin current by mapping through some uh, fields that, uh, that is excited in the bulk and fall, falling into the horizon by uh, this membrane uh, paradigm. So like by this horizon, the fluctuations around the horizon. Okay, so this field, this five dimensional field maps this um, collective transport on the boundary to the excitations near the horizon. And from the excitations near the horizon, from the universality of excitations near the horizon, you can read off these transport coefficients. And it turns out that, for example, for uh, n equals four super young means, and for a very general class of systems, this uh, shear viscosity divided by the entropy turns out to be one over four pi. This is a universal result discovered in 2001, and that that uh, that put holography in the agenda of um, of particle um, physicists essentially. So the question now is that can we find similar universal universal phenomena uh, in the presence of spin spin transport? I don't have an answer to this, but um, I have an indication that this may be indeed the case. So, but of course it becomes important in that case to, to construct a holographic theory where you have, you replace that J, that current with the spin current and the, and the, the, the field, the bulk field now becomes the spin, the spin connection, which now becomes five dimensional spin connection. So we need to construct a, a dynamical setup. But it's quite important, as, as I mentioned a couple of times, to, to keep the, these two sources, the, the field bind and the spin connection, separate from each other. So you need the first order formulation of, uh, of gravity. And also, it would be nice to have uh, practical to have some analytic black hole solutions. For both of these two reasons, we looked at um, this, this theory with the um, low log turn Simon's ADS gravity in five dimensions. I'm not gonna, I don't really have too much time to get into details of this theory. It's a very interesting theory. It's a turn Simon's theory. This is a turn Simon's action in five dimensions based on this group algebra, SO4,2. And there have been uh, a lot of work on this. So people have uh, identified the boundary symmetries of uh, solutions to this. So there are ADS-like solutions, uh, anti decisor like solutions. And uh, people have identified, for example, the boundary symmetries, and they found that um, they correspond to a similar little model in four dimensions for this uh, conformal field theory with, uh, with the group G. Um, so it's like a general, you can think of it like a generalization of Katz-Moody um, um, theory uh, to, to four dimensions. And um, in this terms, this turn time theories typically are, are non-dynamical, but in four dimensions larger than four, five and equal uh, to five, they become, there are some local degrees of freedom unlike in three dimensions. So that's why it becomes interesting. But still there's a lot of algebraic structure. So you can write down all the uh, Einstein's equations in terms of uh, Maxwell's equations based on this gauge field and things like that. So this becomes really important, um, easy to, to derive the, um, to write down the equations of motion and solve them. Okay, you can essentially just use, just to solve Einstein's equations based on this theory by using algebraic methods. And I'm not gonna get into all of that, but it is related to, if you write this action in terms of, um, five-dimensional Einstein-like gravity, then it becomes like there is a, there is a, there is a gauss bonnet like term, there is a Ricci term, and there is a cosmological constant. Okay, so uh, let me directly come to the conclusions. Um, so there are different kinds of solutions that you can, I'm gonna skip some of the solutions here, so let me find the, the most interesting ones. So for example, here, what you find is that um, you, you get first of all analytic solutions. So this is this is an example where we turn just a single axial source. This is one of the components of the spin connection. Um, and then you you, you just uh, solve the, the system completely. You do the thermodynamics and, and transport using holographic prescriptions of calculating two point functions and one point functions. And yet then you get the system has an energy. This is a conformal fluid. You, as you can see that the uh, P is just uh, E divided by uh, minus one, one third of E. And, um, and there's a non-trivial uh, shear part. And there's a non-trivial spin current, even in the absence. So the, the, there is no anti-symmetric part of the energy momentum tensor here, but you can see that the spin current is still non-trivial because essentially because of the sources. So there is a source, okay, so this tensor. Uh, in this case, of course, when you set this to zero, the, the entire spin current will vanish. So there's a different type of solution that you can write down. Um, I'm not, again, not going to get into details here. What you will, get, what you see is that uh, again, a conformal fluid and with, uh, with different kinds of spin sources, 
And here, the important part is that there is, a, there is a also a non-trivial intrinsic torque in the system. So here, if you set the spin sources to zero, you will get zero. But if you go to one, the next order in the, in the derivative expansion, you find some, uh, some non-trivial um, non uh, spin current generated. So this is a, a component of the spin current that is completely sourced by vorticity, as you can see. Okay, so vorticity is just uh, uh, in, in the presence of non-trivial vorticity, vorticity, this transport coefficient, which relates the spin current to the vorticity becomes uh, a precise number, just given in terms of T squared. Of course, it's a conformal value, but there is a chance that this may be, uh, this number can be universal, for example. So this is, the, this is something um, similar to what is called the chiral torsional effect, because also there is a, there is a torsion component which generates spin current, which was studied in, in, 2000, in like last year on the lattice. Okay, um, and we can also think of the same thing as some kind of a, what is called the Barnett effect. So magnetization of an uncharged body of um, atoms by, by rotation. So if you just rotate uh, a system with, uh, with an uncharged system, it just becomes magnetized. So this is called the Barnett effect. And there is, a, there is an analog of Barnett effect in nuclear systems that was essentially, this experiment was done again last year, uh, which, which found something like, like this. So this is what I'm talking about here, yeah, this component. So vorticity generates some current. So all of these numbers can be compared to, to experiments, um, well, but we need, to, we need to have a little bit of uh, more, um, more control over the, over the system. So here, this is my last slide, essentially. Um, here I'm showing that there are some kind of novel possibilities for transport, spin transport as well. So this is another component of the spin, spin current. And um, here what you see, for example, is something like a vertical hole spin current. This is a spin current generated by uh, the component transfers to, the, to this um, torsion component here. And also at the same time proportional to vorticity. So in the presence of uh, some dislocation uh, that is perpendicular, that is, um, uh, that is perpendicular to the to the vorticity, you have a new effect. Okay, so this is essentially what what this is. Uh, so, so all I mean, my my um, bottom line is that all these kind of interesting effects you wouldn't be able to 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 get if uh, in a in a precise way with a given coefficients if you didn't do if you didn't know about holography. So it's quite important that holography is uh, is is helping us with uh, with this. A different corner of physics as well. So let me um, summarize. So as I said, there was uh, some strong demand to develop relativistic hydrodynamics with spin degrees of freedom. And I think I made the point that torsion uh, acts as a source for the spin current. It's quite important to include it in the systems. And um, well, we then derived the hydrodynamic equations and constructed constitutive relations. And then we have seen that there are some novel effects from that comes from hydrodynamic effective action. And um, this John Simon's theory in five dimensions provides uh, a, a, a nice toy theory, which is um, quite treatable because of um, a lot of symmetry in the system. And then you can characterize the spin transport coefficients using this. So I will just leave the outlook here and um, uh, thank you for your attention. So thank you, Ajahn. Uh, so we are a little out of time, but we can take a couple of questions, I guess. But before starting the questions, uh, I should say that uh, afterwards, finishing with the questions, we are going to take a group photo, so please do not go yet, okay? So any questions now? If there are no questions, I can ask some questions, Ojan. So you considered Lovelock theory, right? Uh, but in five dimensions, for instance, you could have considered other type of toy models, which involves uh, torsion naturally, such as uh, uh, also theory of gravitation, such as a mcdowell mansuri type theory, uh, if you are aware with that. So since you are working in ADS space-time, you have this natural homogeneous space. And uh, thinking about it in terms of a Cartan geometry, uh, torsion would come into play naturally. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, indeed. And, so all of that, indeed, all of that can be, can be used as different kind of um, uh, ways to approach this spin transport using holography. But uh, uh -huh. the reason that we did this, well, for the, as a twofold. Right? So first of all, we wanted to construct analytic black hole solutions. I haven't shown you the, the black holes. I just showed you the charges of the black holes like this. Uh -huh. But um, this is, so this is one thing that it, there is a lot of control here. You can use just analytic methods to compute um, the black hole solutions. Sure. And then um, another thing is that the ho ho the holography, the holographic uh, prescription for this low log chance theory was established before. 
ah, okay. we, didn't, we didn't have to do any any work so that was already worked out in especially in this um, Banyados Miskovich Tyson paper uh, this was worked out okay. so for, for example the Fram gram expansion and how to map you know endpoint functions on the boundary of ADS to to, to the um, you know, to the to propagation of fields, etc. So everything was uh, was established. Okay. Um, any other questions? Technology, we couldn't understand it. Curiosity. Do we have to go five dimensions? Especially? Uh, is there anything special about being in five dimensions? Not really. No, I think you can do the same thing. Can you can you live also in seven dimensions? In 11? Seven. In seven. Uh, yes, I th think you can do it, seven dimensions, but then if you, um, well, there can be two reasons for that. I mean, either, you, either you're interested in um, spin transport in a higher dimensional field theory, or you yeah. compactify your seven dimensions, including an S4 or something like that, or S3. S3, yeah. Lower, yeah, S3 to lower, lower dimensions. Okay, uh, I'm just, uh, it's another alternative, is it? Yeah, I think it's another other alternative, but you need the first order formulation of, of that theory. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think that can be done. Okay, yeah, All right. Another thing is just to, to use, you know, super gravity and try to see in super gravity, you <laughs> can just use the, ba the more familiar techniques of uh, holography of uh, gauge gravity correspondence to, to calculate spin current. So that, that we haven't studied. No, five dimensional super gravity with torsion. Exactly. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, did you, or uh, do you know anything about this? Uh, you, you mentioned the graphene. And uh, do you think uh, there's an added material in two dimensions that contains some lattice symmetry and which also has spin transport quantities? And did they investigate under these lattice symmetries, this spin transport effect? Mm -hmm. There are, yes. I mean, this, this has been, sorry, um, uh, the example I, I showed uh, was taken from a paper. So these, well, well, I mean, not Kondo himself, but this entire thing essentially by, started by Kondo in 50s. So this is quite an old subject. In condensed matter, in the context of condensed matter, using torsion, is, is, it goes by, back to, to Kondo. But uh, the paper, I, I've taken it from, uh, from this paper, which is, you know, relatively more recent. <laughs> which were indeed studying dislocation. So this, this, using dislocations, they were generating, so this is a theory, of course, they, they uh, proposed that you can generate spin current. Mm -hmm. But another way of generating currents uh, or, or other kind of um, currents in, in the system would be not only torsion, but also like curvature. So curvature also couples to, to spin current as I said. So they can also generate some kind of spin current. We can couple the gravity to point group symmetry then, right? In this case, at least. Uh, I mean, uh, not a dynamical gravity, but yes, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. So I guess if you have more questions or if you have more questions, Umut, to Umut Gürsoy, you can send them a mail, right? <laughs> or send them through your questions. Yes, yeah, through yeah, please, please, um, please send me, I'm, you're welcome, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Umut Ojam. Can you please stop sharing your screen now? And all of the participants are welcome to open their uh, screen so that we can take um, a group photo now. So it'll take a, like two or three minutes. I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> okay. So I'm taking one by one. There are lots of familiar faces, which is nice to see. Ah. <sighs> Let's see how long we can smile. <laughs> um, I think I am done. If anybody else is also taking uh, group photos from the organization committee, I think I am done. All right. <laughs>